Uh, um, so how much is that? So. Hey, everybody! Welcome to the podcast editor mastermind show where we get into the business of podcast editing, not just the tech. I'm your host of the evening, Jennifer Longworth, and above me we have Carrie Caulfield, Eric of YayaPodcasting.com. Check out my shop at YayaPodcasting.com <laughs> backslash shop. And uh, the, the bottom corner we have I'm Daniel Abendroth of RothMedia.audio, and I, I don't have merch to push. No, but you and our special guest above you ha- have your twinking, your twinning, twinkies, twinning. <laughs> Anything but a Yeti. And that special guest is the one, the only Mark Deal of lots of things. Podcast Atlanta, Podcast Guest Academy, Podcast Editor Conference. Uh, he's, he likes podcasts and podcasters. And, and, and I'm also <laughs> a model for podcast shirts. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a model for podcast shirts that you can get at Carrie's link, uh, yayapodcasting.com slash shop if you like the shirt. So, Mark, welcome to the show. Jennifer, thank you so much for having me. This is great. I remember when we met, you said something along the lines of, I'm not a podcast editor, but I love podcast editors. That's still true. And I run a group of almost 6,000 uh, podcast editors with Steve Stewart. And the the hidden secret is, is like, I'm not really a podcast editor. I do like some macro editing and then send it off to a real editor. Named Steve Stewart. His name is Steve Stewart. <laughs> I feel like we have to, you know, take a shot or a drink anytime Chris Curran or Steve Stewart is mentioned on this show. Or Tom Kelly. Or Tom Kelly, yeah. Right, mm-hmm. you no know, sparkly jacket, yeah. Yeah. And and I, I'd like to say I'm president of his sparkle jacket fan club. So <laughs> he has three. So. so maybe you can wear one yeah. and be an entourage. Be I a Tom, uh, Tom Kelly uh, double. I should get a pink sparkle jacket. Tom Kelly per watch and uh, we'll be in touch. Yeah. Paula Jenkins of Just Busters has one. And at She Podcast, we're all like, do you know Tom Kelly? And she's like, why does everybody keep asking me that? We're like, it's the sparkly jacket. So shout out to you, Paula. Also, sparkly jacket. Okay. So anyway, we're here to talk about business plans and business models and businessy business type stuff. So Brian, go ahead and throw your question up. What is the difference between a business plan and a business model. Let's just go ahead and get that determined because when I went for an SBA loan, they wanted to see my business plan. And as like, you should, well, yeah. As, yeah, well, I didn't have one. Well. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, I don't know what to give you for this. Right, right, right. So I you know, got connected with somebody. Well, first, I'll start off by saying I, I co-founded a company and we wrote about a thousand business plans over a course of five years. And one of the reasons you have a business plan is for an SBA loan and, and business plans are valuable. That being said, I'm finding a lot in the, you know, the online entrepreneur space and certainly in the podcast editing space where people are trying to start their own podcast editing business. They're really trying to figure out where do all the pieces of a business fit in? So instead of of writing a big, thick 30 page, 100 page business plan document because you know what you want to do. You're just documenting these are the things I'm going to do, projecting your financials so the bank will give you the, the SBA loan. I propose a, a, a business model map. So it's it's almost like you're, you're traveling to your favorite conference, say like PodFest or Podcast Movement or maybe even Podcast Editors Conference. And, and you, you have a choice. You could fly, you could drive, you can you know take the interstates, you can take the back roads, but you need to have a destination. And you want to understand where the things are between where you're at now and where you want to be, whether it's a gas station, the airport, the Uber ride, everything. And so that's the the purpose of the, the business model uh, map that, uh, that I propose pose on one page. You have all the elements of a business plan. You don't have to write many, many pages. It all fits on one piece of paper. And then you can strategically map out where things fit in. Nice. Just a basic overview. And then we'll put the pieces together later or as they come, they'll just fall into place. Also, like kind of like one of those puzzles I, I do with the old folks at the old folks home where you can see the puzzle piece cut out and so you kind of know where it goes. It's not a blind puzzle, but it has the outline and the little pieces and everything. Can... And it'll definitely stand out if a piece is missing, right? Yeah. 
And yeah. that's the whole point of this. I mean, there's a lot of times that people have uh, discussions, especially in this online space. Everyone focuses on, on you know, marketing and sales. Carrie, I know you're a big fan of branding. Uh, so, <laughs> so people talk about that, but they forget some of the elements of such as the activities and the resources. So it's those puzzle pieces that are missing. When you look at the map, you're like, what's this big hole over there? Oh, don't look. Don't worry about that. But I've got this great, uh, you know, sales marketing engine. Yeah, but what what about this over here? So that's why I like the the, the map, and I, I do love the analogy of a of a jigsaw puzzle. Yeah, I think that you need in order to do the branding and the marketing. I think this like I make the assumption that you've already done the plan, like you have laid out the foundation because you you need to know why you're going, how you're going to get there, and what your you know what that journey is going to be like before you can even talk about or think about what you're going to communicate to your customers to get them to come, come do it with you. Right. So that's, yeah. Yeah. Agreed. I mean, that's Cat and I Joe's problem, right? He didn't know where he was going. He didn't know where he was going <laughs> or where he was go. So <laughs> that was a uh, Cat and I Joe for you. Wow. I, t- I totally messed up that song. <laughs> <laughs> should, we, should we do another take real quick so I can get it right? <laughs> no. <laughs> He's all right with it. Well, let me just add in one more thing to that question. What type of podcast editors need to think about that plan? Do Is this something that freelancers and side hustlers also need to think about along with the full-time editors? I think so, because especially the side hustlers and the freelancers, the people that are starting off, perhaps they have a, a resource constraint. Maybe they don't have the, the big budget for Facebook ads. Maybe they don't have 40 hours a week to devote to Instagram or, or whatever marketing channel. Maybe they have 10 hours a week that they need to get everything done. And having that map, you can plot out everything that you need to do, whether it's it's marketing, whether it's actually editing podcasts, whether it's uh, servicing the invoice and making sure your, your bills are get paid. So again, I think the one page map is is relevant to, to anyone, whether they're a freelancer or an individual starting off in the podcast editing space, or maybe even someone who has a team the, of, of editors that do the, the shows for them, or somebody that wants to branch out into other areas of the podcast production space beyond just editing. At what point, I mean, I I know my answer to this, but I didn't do a business plan until I'd been editing for two years and then wanted the SBA loan. Ideally, when should you do it? The business plan or the business model? I did just get them mixed up, didn't I? (laughs) Well, I didn't do either one. So kind of, yeah, I didn't do a business plan, like plan is what I mean with the SBA loan. Do you need one of those unless you're going to SBA loan or do you just... Yeah, we'll go ahead and talk about business plans first, because that's what everyone thinks of is a business plan. And this is coming from somebody I I made a living of of writing business plans, you know, almost a thousand of them. I think you need a business plan if you are seeking venture capital funding uh, because they want to see what their return on investment is. I think you need a business plan if you're going to a bank like an SBA loan because they want to see what their risk of uh, of putting this loan together and servicing this loan for you. Yes. Pause for, so when we say SBA, we're talking about the Small Business Administration. They offer loans to small businesses. So I just want to clarify that that's. Yeah. And I was buying a studio. That's why I was getting a loan. Yeah. So. OK, now continue. Mark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there's, there's a few other reasons. In fact, I was doing business plans for foreign nationals that were wanted to come into the U.S. And, and start a business. So we were writing business plans specifically for immigration purposes, which was you know, a, a pretty uh, niche market there. Uh, so that's what you need for a business plan and why you would need a business plan. But I don't think that somebody I do think it's a good process to plan out and map your business. But I don't think going through the the 30, 100 pages, all the five-year financials, which are all fiction, by the way. Uh, it never pans out the way that anyone plans it. Uh, so why do it? You know, Just map everything out on one piece of paper, and then that way you can look and see where your holes are at, where the opportunities are at, things that you need to strengthen, uh, as well as give you an idea of where you can go. Cat and I, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> so how often should you go back? And so once you've created the document, assuming, how often should you go back and take a look at it and tweak and revise? I would think that it's really up to the individual. I would not say revise it every week. 
it probably doesn't <laughs> hurt to have some type of regular review process, whatever fits an individual. I know a lot of businesses do a, an annual review process where they look to see how different business units and, and activities that they're doing, as well as uh, their growth playbook of what they're projecting in the future. That would be a good time to take a look at your uh, you know, business model map there and say, oh, am I doing all these things? Oh, I've really excelled in this region. I, you know, this piece over here really needs to be strengthened up. What can I do there? Oh, there's potential partnership opportunities that I didn't think about a year ago that now I'm set up for. So it really depends on the person. Perhaps annual is a good process. I would steer clear of doing it every week because you can't be strategically thinking every single day. You got to be tactical. You got to actually get the work done. Uh, so plan the time to be strategic, you know, maybe at, a, at an annual process or when you're starting out. So put something together, we start out and then a year later, come and revisit it. So it really depends. Yeah, I was kind of wondering as far as getting started. Is this one more thing that'll help you get started or something that's going to hinder you from, you know, getting started? You're going to overthink it. Oh, my gosh, if I don't get this done, I'm not going to get started. But then again, it's. I think it's definitely something that you should do before you get started or early on. And it doesn't take very long to do. In fact, the uh, the, the business model talk that I did at a podcast editors conference, I think I covered every element in, in less than 20 minutes. And the course that we put together for the podcast editor academy members I think all the video elements together is just over an hour. Now, granted, we broke that up into 11 modules. But again, each one is like five minutes, seven minutes. It's, it's very brief. And the fact you have to put everything together on one piece of paper, you have to be concise. So my advice starting out on the first block is like, just jot something down and don't worry about it. We'll, we'll come back to it as we fill everything else out. So I think it's a, it's a pretty quick process and it forces you to think about certain elements that most other, uh, you know, people and processes and things online don't, uh, don't really talk about such as, you know, your cost structure and, and activity resources and how you're actually going to serve your, your customers. A lot of it is just marketing funnels, marketing funnels, and I think that kind of misses the you know, the broad picture of actually running a sustainable business. Kind of in that vein. I mean, I think we, you know, my wife and I, because we never actually like had a business model. We just kind of like been winging it. But this past year, we attempted to come up with a plan for the year. And essentially, we just kind of like mapped out all the different avenues that we wanted to tackle. So like I'm working on a Reaper course. We're talking about starting a podcast. Um, just like different things that we focus the business. Unfortunately, like COVID happened. So like everything kind of went out the window. But like, is that kind of like similar to what you're talking about? Or like, how does that fit in? So all the different courses and things, that would be one of the nine blocks. And that would be your revenue sources or revenue streams. So you could put, uh, say, a Reaper course in there. And how does that tie into what you do? Well, you're an expert in Reaper. You're offering Reaper uh, production services for your clients. Uh, but for people that want to do it themselves and fulfill their, their own podcast production, but they really like your talent in, in Reaper, that's a, that's a segment that you could you know, help people out and that you weren't able to do before in uh, just having a, a production. So uh, offering courses would fit into the the revenue sources and revenue streams, but your, your customer segments would be the same. The people that you're actually delivering, producing shows for, your marketing may be the same because you may be bringing people in the same marketing route, either... And it just turns out that they had the budget for you, so you produce it, or maybe not, but they want to do it themselves. Well, then they fall into the course. So a lot of those other blocks wouldn't change, or maybe they have slight deviations or really leverage all the other work that you're doing and then adding another piece like that. So yeah, I think the process of doing something, adding something like a course, you could see where it fits in there. I've talked to other people that want to add something, but it really didn't seem to, although it was a revenue source, but it really didn't plug into all the other blocks that they were actively working on. And I was already predicting that it was going to fail because it's just so much newness that uh, they really haven't looked at. So what are the elements and what do you start with? I personally start with the... Well, so the, start with the first one, the value <laughs> proposition. You know, what your customers get out of out of what you do. So this is really the the value that you provide. Are you reducing, in the case of podcast editors, are you reducing uh, the time 
for podcasters to produce their show. Maybe you're reducing the stress. Maybe you're offering a higher quality product than they would be able to do themselves. The other value proposition, what your clients get out of what you do. So I'm just going to add to that because this is something that I think a lot of people trip over is that value proposition. And I think Agreed. for me, yeah, that for me, that's your elevator pitch. It could be a part of your elevator pitch. In fact, what I tell people is value proposition. Go ahead and write your idea and be very brief. Don't don't spend any more than five minutes on value proposition. And yes, value proposition is the crutch, is the core. It's the part of your elevator pitch. But right now, don't spend a lot of time on it. Just jot down like I edit podcasts for people and just put that in your value proposition and then go through all the other eight elements. And by the time you've done all those, you've really are able to really refine and distill down your value proposition. And I think your value proposition, as well as the next segment that I hope we get a chance to talk about, the, the customer segments, those two together, I think, form an, an elevator pitch because it's, you know, it's what you do and who you do it for and probably why you do it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's but that's how I got my head around that whole concept, because you hear about it a lot, but nobody really says what it means. So <laughs> yeah, it's like a fancy buzzword, like value proposition, blah, blah, blah. But like actually, you know. <laughs> Defining it as like it's your elevator pitch like really helps because that's actually my wife and I are going to sit down and I'm supposed to do it today, but you got pushed back till tomorrow. So I'm glad actually for that. So we can have this conversation, but just like figure out, I guess, what that value proposition is and who we are serving and like how we serve them. Mm -hmm. And I find it's a big stumbling block for a lot of people starting out especially starting a new podcast editing business, because there's a lot of editors, like how am I different from all these other editors? And a lot of people feel that way. In fact, the, the person that's listening to this now may feel that way. Like, well, I'm going to edit podcasts. How am I different than, than, than all the people that, that are talking here? Uh, but then you go through the other elements of the, the business model, and then you can see how you can really be different in your own value proposition. But it's very hard when you feel like you have to solve everything in value proposition. I tell people, be very quick, very brief. We'll do everything else and then come back to value proposition and it's easier to do. So where do you go after that? You start with value proposition as best you can at the moment. Then what do we do? Yeah, I personally then like to go to the the customer segments. This is your market. This is your your niche. These are the the people that you serve, and and what are they like? What uh, what specific needs do they have? And and what channels can they be reached through? Why do you want to serve them? And why would they want to be served by you? So really defining the audience uh, that you are serving, at least starting for. I know. If, a lot of people say, I want to serve everybody. Don't start there. Start with, you know, such very, a bad idea. <laughs> it is such a bad idea, right? Yeah. You, you, can, you yeah. can grow later and maybe, you know, pivot a little bit, not a lot, but pivot a little bit. But yeah, be very, very niche and very, very focused. Um, start with the customer segments. And I personally, I think a good elevator pitch incorporates the the value proposition and your customer segments. You marry those two together and then it becomes a, a really good elevator pitch. If you're required to do something like that. For me, an elevator pitch really is just the act of getting comfortable with telling people what you do and why. Like, really. True. And it turns out that most people don't want to hear from you, Carrie. <laughs> no, I hate to say it, but it, that's really that's true of everybody. You know, they don't want to hear like, Mark, what uh, what's your elevator pitch? And then you statically yeah. talk to them. Uh, well, see, I don't do it. So I go low key mm -hmm. and at, at I do this like when I go to remember in-person conferences. What? Oh, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things, and it really wasn't about the pitch. It was about being comfortable uh, explaining to people what I do, essentially. Like, But I would go to every vendor and I would introduce myself. And if they're a question, because they're trying to sell me something, right? So they want to know about what I do. So I give them my elevator pitch. And by the end of the conference, it just... It's refined and rolls right off my tongue. There you go. There you go. I personally like the way that Michael Port defines it in his uh, book, Book Yourself Solid. He he hates elevator pitches. He calls them the uh, who and do what statements. And I kind of break down how 
you know, this elevator pitch or the who do what statement is a combination of your value proposition and your customer segments. Uh, for example, you know, I help single mothers sound their best while expressing their frustrations on podcasts. Well, I've talked about two elements of a value proposition as well as my, my customer segment. And that way it really helps identify people that not just what you do, but who, who you do it for. And I think that helps. They're like, Oh, you know, I know somebody who's a single mother, uh, you know, maybe Mark, you'd be a great editor for them. My like, granted, if not, just an example. <laughs> I love that. I do. And I, and I think really that what that does, that that exercise at like conferences for me, or just be, talking about it with people practicing that pitch, it's just me getting comfortable with uh, and, and being clear on what I do. It helps me clarify it personally. So then I can communicate it in other ways to to potential customers. So. Could an elevator pitch also keep you focused, I guess, in a way? As an example, I started a nonprofit a couple of years, like several years ago, and we came up with like our mission statement, which essentially is kind of like an elevator pitch. So essentially, like you have your mission statement. So if you like something comes up, like, is that something we want to pursue? Well, does it fulfill our mission statement in your business? Like if you've got like all these ideas that you want to like, do like does it fit your you know your elevator pitch your business model and that way you're not getting distracted by all these different things and kind of kind of focus on like what works or like what will get you to your goal right yeah i would agree with that a mission statement a mantra the this elevator pitch the combination of a value proposition and customer segments uh, the who do what statement i think all those to, to be able to to simplify it and really distill it down into like seven words or or less if you're able to do that is is really powerful as long as you still stand out with as few as words as possible and i i think that's great that way not only you know what you do but other people know what you do too and I think we're, you know, kind of going through this and thinking about this because I think this really does hang up editors doing business. I really, they really get stuck on this part. And so I know there's a lot of other stuff to get to, but like these things that are this value proposition, mm -hmm. you know, you're saying be quick and, and I am, I am down with that. I'm like, don't put a lot of thought into it, but I think it does really get hung up, but you're going to go through it and then come back to all these other things. And it's going to, you're going to expand on it later. So right. And saying. they all kind of surround the value proposition. So then when you come back to the value proposition, it's going to be so much easier because you have uh, such a clear idea of what you do and what you don't want to do. And, and knowing what you don't want to do is as important, perhaps more important than knowing what you want to do. Yeah. So then what happens? Then what's next? So we know our value proposition. We know where we're about. We know who we're working with. So you got your value proposition and your customer segments. There's the the channels. This is essentially the sales and marketing. Are you going to do outbound sales or inbound marketing? Are you going to use you know, social media? There's tons of different channels to, to leverage. But basically, how are you going to reach your, your customer uh, segments, essentially your market, and then convert them into... Uh, into paying clients. So that's a, it's a big step and there's lots of little strategies and things to do in there. But a lot of people focus on just that one thing and I'm saying, Hey, it's, it's just one box. It connects your know, value proposition to your, to your market, your, your customer segments, your, your ideal clients. And that's just that, that one block. So you said something in the podcast talk that I found really powerful. Oh, tell and me that what that was. was. <laughs> that was pick one social media channel. Uh, one, just yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that is fabulous advice. Pick one, get to know it, work it, make it work for you. And then before you add anything else in, master that one channel. And, and I think that was the best advice I've heard in a long time in terms of social media. Thank you. I follow that myself because I'm not on a lot of social media platforms, but the one I'm on, I, uh, I'm there. So, you know, people can find me on, you know, Facebook, LinkedIn and Twitter. Now, granted, I don't spend a lot of time on Twitter nowadays, but uh, I used to be fairly Smart. active there for, uh, yeah, it's become a bit, <laughs> bit of a dumpster fire. Yeah. Uh, 
but and, and those are the, the places where I, I tell people to find. And usually it's it's Facebook since I, I run all these uh, these Facebook groups. But and I'm not really good at that. I don't consider myself a social media expert uh, because I'm not a social media expert. But some people consider themselves social media experts like, great, maybe they are a good resource or a partner to, to work with if that's something I need. And I like how like so far the order of it is very logical because by the time you decide like your marketing channels and like, you know, picking that one social media, you need to know who your customer is because you don't want to like get focused on one social media uh, platform whenever your, your target customer is on something completely different. Exactly. Like uh, a past guest you had on the show, Chris Hines, when he talked about his customer segments, he likes dealing with, uh, you know, with like you know, sports and entertainment uh, type uh, podcasts. And then he talked about his marketing channels. He's big into social media and he talked about his his hat, his use of hashtags and things like that. That's it's narrowing down more on the strategies on, on channels to connect his value proposition as customer segments. But that's just you know, one block in channels. It doesn't talk about how you serve people, how you communicate with them. How do you uh, partner up with other people to do more? So where in these blocks is what you do? Like, this is why I'm doing it and who I'm doing it for and how I'm getting my message out. But how do you address like what you actually do? Or do you address what you actually do? That's that's back in the original value proposition where we start there and we finish there. That's uh, what your customers get out of what you do. Now, it's not like I edit podcasts. It's like I make set people sound better on podcasts. Uh, I guess... As far as you say, like what you do, the physical activities, it, it would go in a block called activities. That's what you spend your time on. This is what you do that that creates the value for for the clients. This isn't what they're paying for. This is just what you do. So people aren't paying you to edit podcasts. People are paying you to make them sound good on podcasts. You just do that by editing podcasts. That's your activity. But the value proposition is they sound great. They don't have to spend a lot of time doing it you know, whatever else you want to throw in there. Okay. That answered the question. You have a little block called activities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. Exactly. And, and activities can be, you know, for podcast editors, it can be actually editing shows, but it can also be managing your customer relationships, managing marketing channels, uh, you know, refining your value proposition, managing your, your, your cost structure and revenue. So there's lots of little things and activities that are more than just opening up your digital audio workstation, throwing in some files, Cutting, pacing, moving stuff around. You can tell I'm a really bad editor. <laughs> <laughs> that's all you do? Wait, that's what I do. <laughs> oh. Wait, Daniel. So where do the customers fall in? Like the customer relationships, is that? Yeah, thank you for that lead in. Yes, the, the customer <laughs> relationships. So once somebody is actually paying you, I move them into a different block. And this is the customer relationships. And this is how you how you interact with your customers. Do they email you files? Do you email them a finished product? Uh, do they call you on the phone? Do they send you text messages? Are they sending you uh, social media DMs and PMs? I thought your interview with Brittany Felix on a previous episode was great because she really talked about her customer relationships. And for her, she only takes clients that deal directly in her project management system because that's what her team works in. That's how she works efficiently. So she's really narrowed down how she wants to service her customers and what relationships that she wants to have. People don't call her or email her. They all have to fit inside of her project management system. Now, some people you know, need that uh, additional handholding and maybe you offer that level of service. And I know there's some editors that will do the same job, the same editing job, but depending on the level of service that you want, uh, you may pay twice as much. Nice. That's uh, more to consider, like how to do my pricing structure. It because there uh, there are clients who I know that on Tuesday I'm going to edit their episode. It's going to be there. I'm just going to upload it. I don't have to do any hand holding. They don't ever ask questions except for, "Hey, are you invoicing me or what?" <laughs> and, that, <laughs> and that's all I heard from them. Otherwise, it's like smooth sailing. But then there's the other customers. Oh, by the way. This is this and that is that. And do you have any advice or, you know, so I should. 
Yeah. And, and I personally think that's OK, because a lot of those clients that are certainly at the A game in their field, in their niche, and they know they need that additional handholding, they may say, Jennifer, I really need to be able to uh, to email you or to, to, to call you. How can I pay for that? And maybe you have a level of service. Well, like, well, if you're at this platinum level or bronze level or, or KY level, you know, because of KY production, uh, <laughs> uh, then you pay this level, but then you have access to a booking link and then you can control that. Well, you have to book me during our uh, regular business hours. I need 30 minutes notice. Maybe I need a day notice. Again, you can control that. And depending on their level of service that they pay for, you can kind of ration off your customer relationship, even though you're doing the same activity. Otherwise, you know, say it's editing a show. And that's just one way that you could drastically change your own podcast editing business model by just tweaking one box. And that's why I like the idea of putting everything together in a model on just one piece of paper, because then you could see, tweak this, move this over here. Uh, I haven't connected these two pieces, but if I do this differently than these other people, then I'm, I'm totally different. I like that. That's a good way to visualize it. Mm -hmm. So after customer relationships, what else is there to consider? What else is on that model? Well, we've already spot, uh, and that's all on the, I would say like the right hand side of the model. Then you need to talk about your revenue sources because you've talked about the, the value proposition and the customer segments and all basically servicing the people. But then you want to talk about, you know, what are they paying for? And this is where you go into, you know, are, is it a monthly retainer? Are you paying per episode? Do I want to segment on different services? Do I want to offer courses like a, a Reaper course? So all the things that you're going to, to charge money for would go in that, that revenue source. Courses. And then that's all the uh, the external facing part of the business, right? That's what the client's perspective of your business is. That's the value that you create. And But there's a whole other side of the business model that talks about your internal perspective and your, your efficiency. No, no, I'm just like thinking like how like this web kind of works together because like you have your revenue sources, like how does this revenue source tie into your value proposition? Who does it serve? What channels do you market? It just like all that. It's kind of visualizing what that connection is on your on all the boxes. Exactly. Because people aren't paying for what you do. They're paying for what they get. And they are paying for that. If you can maximize that value gap, meaning like let's say you do a job for uh, $200, but it's it's worth uh, $1,000, uh, you know, that's a value gap of, of $800. So every time a client can pay you that $200, they're getting uh, a perceived value of $800. So every, you know, they're going to, they're going to want to do that. So that, that's how you kind of frame your, your pricing together for your, your revenue sources is around value. Not so much, well, it takes me this time uh, to do it. And I want to make a, a certain dollar per hour. And that's okay for some people that want to start off on the cost base. And back when we did the podcast editor survey, we saw that a lot of people were, were kind of doing that. But once they hit about $50 an hour, it was like a total another inflection because then people that were getting paid a at around 50 bucks an hour, they realize value proposition and how they can maximize that value gap. And then rates started going through the roof. So when you talk about value gap and, and the perceived value the customer is getting, how do you really measure that? Like, how do you know what that is? Uh, well, hopefully you really know your clients and you know your customer segment uh, pretty well. And you can somehow quantify whether it's qualitatively in, you know, fuzzy, warm buzzwords or qualitatively, you know, numbers and metrics and things like that. But, you know, if, if somebody makes a, let's say they're, they're a professional and they want to charge a, a hundred bucks an hour, say they're like a CPA or an attorney or whatever it is that they, they need to do, but it would take them like eight hours to do your job because they're not as efficient as you, nor would it be as, as, as good. You know, that's a, that's a perceived value there of, of $800, but it could also be uh, what the, the marketing value of this is like, say you're doing a show for them and you know, what's it mean for sponsors or for their own internal uh, customers. Maybe it's uh, the, the cost of a, of a therapy and a therapist. Uh, if, if you've seen some of the people that have a podcast these days, it's really about their own personal therapy. And therapists are pretty expensive. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, so, uh, yeah, if you want to make, you know, somebody's therapy sound better on the microphone as a podcast <laughs> editor, that could be your value proposition. Like, hey, 
podcast therapy. Start your own show and I will make you sound less of a, of a crazy wing bat uh, once it goes live. Huh. <laughs> Write that down. Yeah. Is that a t-shirt? Is that a t-shirt? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Brian, write that down. <laughs> I'm going to listen to the playback on that. Yeah. I was very jealous of uh, Michael Jerry's show. I was like, oh, you know, he's got a quote that made it to a T-shirt or at least you know, carried it on his show. Everybody so. can have a T-shirt, right? Yeah. You can come on the show. Give, I'll make you a T-shirt in your honor. Right? That's what this is all about. Like, like, can I share something so good that inspires a, a T-shirt? So, Yes. Yes. Talk about podcast therapy. All right. <laughs> that that's it that's all i got well that's not all mark's got we haven't been i think you said there were nine little blocks right yeah and we haven't gotten all the way around yet we have it and so we'll focus on the the internal perspective this is what you would see inside your business this is your efficiency uh, jennifer we we mentioned it earlier the activities block this is what actually takes your time this is what you uh physically do uh, so editing shows that that's an activity block. Uh, this is the time that you spend in all the other things, such as doing the marketing customer relationships. That's all in activities. And so that's the stuff that you do. And there's another block. That's the things that you need in order to do your job. Uh, you know, what costs you money? And this could be you know, financial resources. Uh, maybe you, you need money for for hosting or your computers. Uh, maybe it's physical resources. I, I know you had a, a podcast studio for a while. Uh, that still do yep. actually. So still it's do. still there. So I mean that is a that that's a a resource that you need uh, to be able to have in order to produce a podcast physically in in one spot versus virtually like a, a lot of people do. So that's a that's certainly a, a resource there. <laughs> So resources, money, time. Exactly. A virtual resource. These are the, the elements that are uh, critical to what you do. Honestly, the audio files that you need from your client is a resource. So if you don't have a way to, to pull in that audio, that's that's something that you need to think about. So there's the activities of what you physically do and then the resources, the things you need to do those activities. So hopefully that makes sense. So Brian made a comment a while back in the, our chat about how many small, tiny, sticky notes you need to do this. I mean, as you're talking about all these different pieces, I would want to like be moving them around. If I was drawing it on a piece of paper, it would just be like crazy. So I, I don't think we've gotten all the way around your circle yet, but still logistically, how do I start putting this together? Like sticky notes? You could do sticky notes on a wall. I've I've seen businesses, they'll have these big workout sessions and have people come in and have this map up and they'll do the, the, the sticky notes. But personally, I just like printing out a sheet of paper and, and have my blocks in there. And I have some of these questions that I ask myself uh, in those blocks. And then I'll start writing down inside the blocks of, of what uh, what it is that you know, I want to do in this little, little block thing here again at a fairly high level, because I want it to be something that I can look at on, on one sheet of paper that being, uh, it's all the way over there. I can't reach it, but I mean, that being said, I do have like 11 by 17 sheets of, uh, of paper. I, sometimes I make them pretty big, but for me, I just use one sheet of paper. If you want to use post-its, you can do post-its. I've got a software I use called mind maple windows. That sounds like it would do the same thing. I mean, it certainly could. Yeah. Yeah. You just have this, this segments and connected to each other and just have the, the branches off that for the mind map. That's certainly one way of doing it. And that's something, uh, and it reminds me a lot of time people talk about resources such as what's the best uh, audio plugin or what's the next project management software. Uh, I would caution people don't rush out and buy something or subscribe to something just because you've heard somebody say, Oh, this is great. This has revolutionized my business. Well, that's their business, not your business. So buy what you need when you need it and unsubscribe from AppSumo emails. <laughs> just, yes. just get the stuff you need. Don't get, don't buy it because it, it has this great sales page. Like, oh, I could totally transform my business. I'd never thought about my business or business model, but this sales page sounds like I could do do that if I buy this piece of uh, software. <laughs> This podcast is sorry. sponsored by AppSumo. <laughs> <laughs> or not. Or not. No. not now. No. No. Told you not it's more like we sponsor AppSumo with our purchases. Uh, that, that is, it's, it's FOMO, right? You don't really need a ton 
to actually run an editing business. So we got resources. All right. So we've got a value proposition. We've got our customers. We've got our marketing tools, which you called something else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I call them channels. <laughs> channels. So there's two more, channels. Yeah, there's two more blocks if you just want me to, if, if that's what you're yeah. getting at. All right. So I'm trying to get, <laughs> like, review them all in all my right. head and get there. I understood. <laughs> understood. So the, the next one is honestly, I believe, is, is one of my superpowers, and, and that's partners, uh, finding partners, strategic relationships and joint ventures. The ability to craft your own business model is great, but if you can find weaknesses and then be able to empathetically build somebody else's business model, whether it's an individual, another podcast production agency or editor or a big company, draft out their model and see where they're strong, where you're weak, and perhaps reach out to them for some type of strategic relationship or joint venture, or perhaps they they just need to be a resource for you, or maybe even you be a resource for them, and that would make them a, a customer or client. So the ability to find strategic relationships and joint ventures through partners is, is great. And that way you can get more information, some more connections and skills, uh, resources, or connections to other markets. It's pretty commonplace in this online space for people to do these joint venture webinars. Essentially, let me offer my product in front of your audience while we get on a webinar together. You know, that's an example of a of a partnership where you're leveraging that partner to reach their customer segment that you don't have. So Brian wants to know what is the most important partnership in your business? Well, of course, I would have to stay say my partnership with Steve Stewart. You know, since we we're here in the podcast editors master, is that a contractual of- obligation that you have to? <laughs> Does Steve make you say that? Are you okay? <laughs> Blink if you need help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in fact, because Steve's not the first person I've worked with in, in the past, so we talked about that. Like, hey, let, let's uh, let's put this in writing. Let's let's have a prenup. And in fact, we're going to have uh, an attorney on in the podcast editors club talking about. Uh, agreements and contracts and and strategic partnerships and essentially the, what's the value of a of a prenup. So yeah, we put something in writing before we started uh, putting all this uh, stuff together. Very cool. I, I like I like legal agreements, but then again, I, I work with attorneys all days. So I think uh, I, I I may sound crazy, but I, I like them. And it's I really think that just, would be a good T-shirt. Well, I like. <laughs> No, I like say that. I like attorneys. I like legal agreements. <laughs> I like legal agreements. <laughs> and, and the ones I, I craft aren't very long. Uh, they're they're fairly you know plain English. Like, hey, I do this, you do this. This is what's expected of you. What's expected of me. This is how we'll handle this stuff. And then when things come up that we haven't talked about before, like, hey, let, let's get together and and resolve how to do this. So. Yeah, if you don't have something like that in writing, it's kind of hard to deal with uh, with with bumps and bruises and, and things in a row. Last segment is cost structure, and that's basically how much does everything cost? You know, whether it's upfront, like say you need to buy computers or monitor or a cool gaming mouse and, and turn your cool gaming mouse into a boring editing mouse like many of us do. <laughs> uh, you know, what are your reoccurring fees, whether it's podcast hosting or, or some of these other digital tools that we use? Uh, what are some fixed costs, uh, such as well, uh, really anything that uh, that's fixed or you know somewhat uh, lower frequency occurring? Uh, variable costs, maybe for every podcast you bring in, you pay other editors to do it, so that's a variable cost there associated with that. If they're not editing, you're not paying them. And then uh, also the improvement cost. If you should be able to to allocate money to better yourself and better your company. And what better way to do that than uh, something that I would love to pitch? <laughs> what would that be, Mark? <laughs> well, gosh, darn it. Thank you for asking. Uh, that would be the Podcast Editor Academy. <laughs> so Carrie is what... losing her mind over here uh... on, on the video. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Good. good. Okay. So, Mark, tell us. What is the Podcast Editor Academy? Some of us were at the Podcast Editor Conference and got the 
the, initials. Oh, Scoop, yeah. But. Yeah. The And the awesome deal. Uh, Podcast Editor Academy is essentially the resource for people that want to start, build or grow their podcast editing business or agency. So the 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 business model that I've talked about, we actually have a course that dives into those and a little bit more in, in various uh, different things, as well as we've segmented a lot of our other courses into those blocks. So when you click on activities, you'll see all of our other lessons that translate to activities, such as as Steve Stewart has done uh, almost every digital audio workstation twice over with other various experts and those replays are inside the academy. As well as we have live office hours every month and all those sort of the sort of things. And, and thanks for throwing up the, the URL. You can find out more <laughs> at podcasteditoracademy.com. Very good. And I have a, like, can I go to a totally unrelated topic? Does anyone mind? Go for it. Okay. I want to ask you about Podcast Atlanta. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, because podcasting is just me and my microphone. It's, it's podcast therapy, as you mentioned before. You know, what? whatever is happening, it's just me and my computer. It's just me, 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 me. But sometimes I need to get out of my head and go meet with other like-minded individuals. And you did this thing in Atlanta and started with a small group through the meetup platform. And how big did you grow that? Uh, we're the uh, second largest podcasting meetup in the world. Uh, the fastest growing because the number one is run by Chris Kermistos and he's been doing it for over 10 years. And I think we're maybe two, 300 members behind him. And we've only been doing it for about three and a half, four years now. So yeah, thanks for, for bringing that up. Podcast Atlanta was really my way of, of getting together with other podcasters because my day job was, was podcasting and everyone knew the, the big names in podcasting and the meta podcasters that podcast about podcasting. But but that's not me. That being said, I like my day job is, is podcasting. I wanted to to meet and network with other podcasters and, and hold events as well as I'll be honest, I wanted Atlanta to be on the map for podcasting. When people thought of what are the good cities for podcasting, it was always L.A. or New York. Atlanta wasn't even uh, on the map then. And we had you know great podcasting companies like how stuff works, which had shows such as, you know, stuff you should know, stuff you miss in history class. So we've got a lot of podcasting companies in Atlanta, but people never thought of Atlanta as a podcasting city. And that was another reason why I started the group was to really put it on the map. And as well as it allowed me to get the people that I wanted to see on stage that I wasn't seeing a lot of it at some of the other conferences because Atlanta is a diverse community. So I wanted to celebrate the diversity that we have in Atlanta by making the stage as diverse as the, the audience. And since it's, it's my group, my organization, I can do that. Very good. So how have you guys been dealing with this current no live meetup situation thing? Have you all been doing virtuals? Have you been we, we've been doing virtuals and I'll be honest with you, our attendance has severely dropped. And you would think that podcasters would be more apt to do virtual events. Well, it turns out since podcasters work primarily virtually, <laughs> when I would do uh, like January, I had 100 people show up. Uh, February, I, I had 100 people show up. Um in fact, Chris Stone, he was he was there uh, at both January and February. I think. So, and then. March, I took off in March because I was running a podcast editors conference with Steve Stewart. Oh, mentioned Steve, so I got to take drink. a drink. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's tea. <laughs> but then we got everything was shut down. So now we've gone to virtual and yeah, not as many people are, are showing up. So our next event we're actually doing with the, the YouTubers of Atlanta. We're doing a, a collaborative event and even still maybe a few dozen people will show up. So when we did physical events, tons of people will show up out of the woodwork. But now that we're shifting the virtual because podcasting is virtual, I think uh, that's why our attendance is dropping off a bit. Because we crave people being around, you know, we're all introverts, but we still need a little bit of extrovertedness to to feed that side, even scratch that itch just for a minute and getting on a Zoom call is not the same at all. Yeah, it's Sorry. not. It's not. It, and also, there are a lot of Zoom calls. <laughs> <laughs> can I just <laughs> can I just tell you how many hours I spend on Zoom each week is not something I want. But wanted. I feel so cool because as podcasters and virtual workers and stuff, we were on Zoom 
like way before this. Mm -hmm. And so now people go, I don't know how to use Zoom. Like, where have you been? I've been using Zoom for a few years. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. My, uh, my eight year old daughter, my 12 year old son and my wife that I will not quote her age. They were not uh, <laughs> big on Zoom and now they're all working through Zoom. Like I've got a pro Zoom account. Let me show you how to use this. And you yeah. know, both my, my son and my daughter have, you know, podcasting microphones now. So they look cool in their, their Zoom <laughs> classrooms. I'm like, great. Get nice. these microphones out of my studio. No <laughs> yetis, though. No yetis. <laughs> no, no yetis. <laughs> anything but a yeti. Yeah, and you can get the anything but a yeti shirt at yayapodcasting.com slash shop. There you go, Carrie. Thank you, John. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else that you'd like to share, like where we can, well, share where we can find you? We know we can find you with the Podcast Editors Club. The Podcast Editors Club on Facebook. That's right. We're very close to 6,000 members. So if somebody's wow. watching that's this crazy. or listening to this, and first off, thank you for listening to my interview on Podcast Editors Mastermind. As you can tell, I, I touched on a few stuff of the past episodes. Go back and listen to all the past episodes. They're great. They're wonderful. I was there for the first one. I got to take a picture. <laughs> it was awesome. Uh, Podcast Editors Club on Facebook. Uh, we're so close to 6,000. So if you haven't joined, please do. We'd love to have you. And, and you also, yeah, you have some some other place on Facebook. Oh, the, uh, yeah, the internet. Oh, I saw you liked one the of the internet. posts on the, yeah, the internet. Yeah, I'm on the internet. Uh, I run a few, I run a few uh, Facebook groups around podcasting. So I run another one called uh, Podcast Guest Experts because before I started podcast, Editor Academy, I started podcast uh, guest academy. My, my nice little soundboard. So I've got a, a Facebook group for for that for podcast guests. And I realize I probably shouldn't pull away from the microphone while I'm talking. I apologize, whoever is editing this, and for those watching. <laughs> yeah, so I've got a few groups, but for as far as editing, I, I this podcast editors club is where it's at. Yeah, I agree. It's a good one. It's pretty good. Yeah. It's pretty, it, 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 you know, it's, it, it's no yaya, -yeah, but. Well, it's not just busters. <laughs> so let's go ahead and wrap this one up then. We've been with Mark Deal today. Thank you, Mark, for joining us. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Carrie, for having me. And Brian. Again, oh, and, and Brian. Brian. In the back. <laughs> Sorry. Well, we always forget the guy in the back. Is that making all everything run and all the yeah. Yeah. stuff pop up? He, he <laughs> it's like magic. Master. <laughs> so i'm jennifer longworth of bourbon barrel podcasting.com you can find me across social media at ky podcasting i'm carrie caulfield eric of yaya podcasting.com and you can find me at, at carrie eric at, on instagram if you like that kind of thing i'm daniel abendroth of rothmedia.audio and you can find me ever i think at the roth media and i'm mark deal you can find me on facebook inside the podcast editors club and he looks so cool with his shades. You folks who don't watch live or recorded, you're missing out on all these visuals this evening. Yeah, this, mm -hmm. this has been great. And uh, you can find Brian Ensminger at TopTierAudio.com and at TopTierAudio on Twitter and Instagram. And Daniel, if someone wants to be on the show, what do they do? Just go to PodcastEditorsMastermind.com and you'll see a link on the top that says be a guest. Click that, fill out the form. And we'll get in touch. Fantastic. Well, thanks again, everyone, for joining us. And we'll be back with you in a couple of weeks. Who's our next guest, Daniel? Uh, Tammy Grable Woodford. And she is going to talk about using newsletters as part of your business. Oh, yeah. I love that one. one. So follow <laughs> us on Facebook, Podcast Editor Mastermind. Join our group. Follow us. Then you'll like know the what's going on. To do other things. Like, subscribe, leave us ratings and reviews. Right, Carrie? No. <laughs> do not you need to put that on a shirt too All right. do not rate and review <laughs> that's All the right. t-shirt yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thanks everyone uh, good night <laughs> <laughs>